just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry o'er the future, for I know Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Ellen. The scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Then Peter said, 
Look, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The uh, passage of scripture that uh, Craig just shared with us comes from the New Testament, and uh, I want for us to return to that story uh, in a few moments. But uh, I want us to begin this morning in the Old Testament. Back in Leviticus, in the shadow of Mount Sinai, where God gave to his people through Moses the law. I think when you and I think of the law, uh, we naturally think first of the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments became the most high-profile part of the law. But, of course, uh, the law that God gave to Moses at Sinai included a great deal more than just those Ten Commandments, including this instruction that comes in the chapter immediately following the Ten Commandments. The Lord said, If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve you for six years, in the seventh year, he is to be set free without having to pay anything. Here's the background for that. Uh, in ancient Israel, uh, an Israelite might have to sell himself into slavery in order to pay off indebtedness. Now that sounds very harsh to our modern ears, uh, but it actually had considerable mercy built into it. First, because you were allowed to sell yourself to a fellow Israelite and there was built into God's law uh, regulations to guarantee fair treatment and compassion towards a fellow Israelite slave. Second, uh, if you were married and had a family, you could bring your family with you and then take your family with you again when your term of service is up. And third, your term of service would be up. This was not a forever proposition. You were required to serve six years in order to pay off your debt, uh, and then you were free after that. So when we hear a reference to slavery like this in the Old Testament law, we need to steer clear of the images that conjures up for us as Americans, because we naturally think of our own history of slavery and the oppression and the cruelty involved there. That's not the look of what we're reading about here in the Old Testament law. The Israelites themselves knew what it was to be slaves, foreigners, in another country. They knew that scene. And God had made it clear to them they were not to recreate that in their own country. So slavery in ancient Israel, as is described here in this law, was a kind of a voluntary option as a way of dealing with debt. And the idea was that uh, after you had served these six years, you were free of that debt, which is not all bad, you know. Uh, I wonder, of all the Americans who are living under a heavy load of debt right now, I wonder how many will be free of that debt in six years. But that was the uh, understanding there in the Old Testament law. You are working to pay off a debt, which... A lot of us spend a lot of our hours doing, working to pay off a debt, and then in six years you were free from it. Well, uh, that was the regulated nature of slavery in ancient Israel, except that it included this caveat a few verses later. A few verses later, the law says this, if the slave declares that he loves his master and does not want to be free, then his master shall take him to the place of worship and pierce his ear, and then he'll be his slave for life. Well, now, what kind of law is that? You know, you've served your required six years of slavery, your term of service is up. Legally, he's free and clear to walk away. It's free man, go back to his home and to his life. And the law gives him an option to forfeit that freedom. The law gives him an option to volunteer to become his master's slave permanently. 
Well, who does that? It's a ridiculous kind of a proposition, but it's built into the law. So for our purposes, maybe it would look something like this. You pay on your mortgage for decades until finally you come to that uh, point where you receive the long-awaited notice that you're paid off. The house that you've been calling your house for all these years actually is now. It's your house. And the next day you go into the bank and you say to the banker, I want to give you my house. The banker says, you want to sell it? No, I don't want to sell it. Says, you want to take out a second mortgage? You want to have a home equity loan? No, no. I just want you to have it. It's been your house all these years. I want it to be your house forever. Let's get out the paperwork. I'll sign it over to you. It's a ridiculous idea. And yet that's essentially what this stipulation of the Old Testament law allowed for. I've served my master for my required six years. I'm done with that service, but if I want to, I can volunteer to go ahead and be his slave from now on for the rest of my life. It's a ridiculous idea. Uh, one day, Jesus is walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, comes across these fishermen. First the two brothers, Peter and Andrew, then shortly after the two brothers, James and John. In both cases, he says to them, follow me. And in both cases, the Bible reports the same reaction. Uh, these fishermen drop what they're doing, and they leave it all behind in order to follow Jesus, which is its own kind of ridiculous thing to do, in as much as I wonder how many of us would do it, right? <laughs> Millions of us who are in churches this morning also calling that same Jesus Lord, calling that same Jesus Master. But I wonder how many of us would engage in that kind of stop, drop, and follow discipleship that you see exhibited by the first disciples. Our preference is for a more reasonable Lord, you know, a Lord who generously offers everything and uh, patiently asks for a little and then sympathetically accepts less than what he asks for. That's our preference. And that may have been the preference of the man that uh, Craig read for us, uh, read, read about for us a moment ago. We call him the rich young ruler. His famous character in scripture, maybe an infamous one. He comes to Jesus one day and asks Jesus about eternal life. And Jesus tells him he needs to obey the commandments. And this well-to-do young man says, I do obey the commandments. I've obeyed them my whole life. And then Jesus says, well, there's just one more thing you need to do. Go, sell all you have, give the money to the poor, and then you come and follow me. And that seemed to the man a ridiculous thing to do. So he walked away from Jesus. He walked away. That's what the Old Testament slave anticipated in that law might not be willing to do, might not be willing to walk away from the master, you see. I want us to come back to that voluntary slave in a moment. First, we need to say a word about Jesus and money. I know that the story of the rich young ruler is a troubling story for earnest Christians. Because we hear Jesus say to this guy, sell all you have, give it to the poor, follow me. And it troubles us. Because we wonder, might he be saying the same thing to us? <laughs> And what if he does? I uh, had a colleague in ministry some years ago who uh, told his congregation, almost upon his arrival at that church, told his congregation that his ongoing mission was this, to separate them from their money. Yeah, <laughs> uh, at some level I admire his candor. I, uh, I don't admire his goal, but I admire his candor in stating his goal. I don't think that was Jesus' goal with the rich young ruler, and I don't think that's Jesus' goal with you or with me. I don't think what Jesus wants is less intrusive, and frankly, I think it's more comprehensive than that. Because just to separate me from my money, you know, 
elevates money to a point of exaggerated significance. I think Jesus wants to separate me from anything that comes between me and him. See. In the uh, mid-1700s, uh, John Wesley came across, he had had this uh, uh, extended contact with some German Christians, came across some of their hymn that he was very impressed by it and translated some of the hymns that he discovered into English so that the English-speaking Methodists would have this devotional resource for themselves. Came across a hymn by Gerhard Tierstegen that he translated into English. We have it in our hymnal, uh, Wesley's translation of it. It's called Thou Hidden Love of God. Very lovely prayer, very meaningful. And along the way it says this. I want you to hear these words and ask ourselves, you know, would we be willing to pray this prayer? Is there a thing beneath the sun that strives with thee, my heart to share? Ah, tear it thence, and reign alone, the Lord of every motion there. Then shall my heart from earth be free when it hath found repose in thee. Is there anything under the sun, is there anything on the earth that competes with God for first place in my life. If there is, he wants to separate that from me and me from that. He wants to come between me and that thing. Not because he doesn't want me to have it. He doesn't want it to have me. Not because he doesn't want me to have it. He wants me to be able to have him. So the rich young ruler wasn't really being asked to make a decision against his money because money wasn't really the point. He is being asked to make a decision for Jesus. He, Peter and Andrew, James and John, you and I, were all asked to make a decision for Jesus at any cost. A decision for Jesus at any cost. The Hebrew slave, anticipated by that Old Testament law, was willing to do what you and I are called upon to do. On paper, it seems like a ridiculous thing to do, you know, to volunteer to belong to someone else for the rest of your life. But then here's the wild card in the whole situation. The law says this, if the slave loves his master, well, there you go, love. If an electrical appliance, you know, isn't working, the first thing you check is to make sure it's plugged in. And if a human being does an unreasonable thing, one of the first things to check for is love. Because love makes us do all kinds of unreasonable things, you know. Love makes people spend time and energy and effort, heart, money, that they wouldn't spend if it weren't for love. Love changes every calculation. It impacts every decision. Love changes how much things weigh, you know. It makes tasks lighter. It makes concerns heavier. Love, if the slave loves his master. So love changes everything, and the Old Testament law knew that. The turning point for this slave was love. At first, his service was about his debt. Now, his service is about his master. He loves his master, and therefore he wants to be with his master forever. In the case of our master, the turning point is also love, and specifically his love, his love for us. So Dottie Rambo wrote, I'm a prisoner of love, a slave to the master. When I came to Jesus, I settled it all. I gave him my life to control. Neither fear nor persuasion could draw me to Christ, but his love has conquered my soul. He holds me secure in his love strong and true. I'm happy his servant to be. In bondage to Jesus forever I'll stay. My soul doesn't want to be free. She was singing the song of that Hebrew slave and singing the song of every disciple who's fallen in love with the master and decided that we don't want to belong to anyone or anything else, but always and only to him. I said last week that during these uh, Sundays of October, I want for us to be talking about stewardship, and I shared my conviction. 
And I believe stewardship is the lived out recognition that it all belongs to someone else. It all belongs to him. It belongs to him, first of all, because it comes from him. And it belongs to him, second, because I've given it back to him. See, I dedicated myself to him. He's put his mark on me as his property. I've signed the dotted line of discipleship. So in the end, there are, I think, two words to be said this morning. First, to those of us who have made that decision somewhere along the way, a reminder. A reminder of what it is we have signed on to. And that is, we belong to him now. We are his happy property. And second, for those who have not made that decision anywhere along the way, an invitation. An invitation to do a perfectly ridiculous thing. To hand over the keys. To sign over the deed. To volunteer to belong completely and forever to the master. Because you love him. And because he loves you. So let's pray together. Ah, happy servants we are, Lord. When we serve not out of our indebtedness anymore, but out of love. Because you've canceled the debt. You've paid the price. But your love has captured our souls. And so we rejoice in belonging to you. And uh, most of us have lived long enough to know it's better. Better to belong to you than anyone or anything else. Thanks be to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's uh, close in a word of prayer just now. By your spirit, Father, help us, each of us individually, to have a sense for the dotted line that is before us, to know what it is individually that we need to answer this day, what we need to say to you, so that we might say it, so that we might sign it, and uh, be made free your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.